Good morning, church. Good to see everyone this morning. We are very thankful for your presence with us. Good to have you this morning. We have visitors in our audience, and we appreciate you. Appreciate you being with us. Hope you'll come back each and every opportunity that you can. We have our little boss here with mom and dad, our son and daughter-in-law. We're glad to have them. You know, you, you, you tell people you only have one job. And Suzanne's one job when we come to church, of course, she doesn't really have many. But her one job is to make sure we have the Lord's Supper. Today, her one job was being a grandmama. And so Zanny was doing Zanny stuff today, and so she forgot the Lord's Supper, so I had to go out and get the Lord's Supper. You only have one job, darling. No, that's not true. But we're glad to see you all this morning and hope that you have a great week. I hope that uh, you put a smile on your face and everybody else's face. Steve said that song was challenging. I've heard that song most of my life. So, But I, he did a fantastic job, and you did as well. And so I appreciate him leading that song for us. Because today I want to tell you about being a blessing. Our lesson this morning as we began, I need to tell you a story. A story I read not long ago, a fellow by the name of Joseph Randolph. Joseph Randolph's story was interesting, what I was reading, at least for that day. You know, usually when we take our kids to school, when we get them out of school, or we get home, whatever, at the end of the day, what are we asking? Well, how was your day? What happened in school? How much homework do you have? That mean old teacher. Now, I can say that because I married the teacher. But, you know, that's what those are the questions we ask the kids, right? Joseph Randolph, though, he didn't ask those usual questions of his child. When his child came home from school, when they met up at the end of the day, his one question, his first question, and usually his only question for the day was, what did you do for somebody else today at school? And as Justin Randolph was telling the story, it's kind of interesting because as he, told, as he was writing the story there, he said, the interesting part of all of that was not that my child, not that I was really trying to do something to him, but it was quite interesting that as the time went on, my child, as we met at the end of the day, and usually, without asking, he would say, well, I opened the door for this one, or I helped take this one's tray up, or I helped Miss So-and-so with the this, that, or the other, that he found that his child had become really what he wanted him to be, a blessing, a blessing to others. Oh, when we realize and think about that story, we realize that we are people that are dependent upon each other. And yet, as the old prophet says, we not all one father has not one God created us. Why do we deal treacherously every man with his neighbor? Sometimes we ask that question because we are dependent upon others. We've talked about before being dependent upon others from the standpoint when we drive down the road. We're dependent upon the individuals that are in front and behind us that they're going to watch out for us. They're going to obey the laws of the land. The individual that's meeting us will also do the same. We are dependent upon them. But from a standpoint of, of economics and consumerism, we understand that we are dependent upon one another, that I need the farmer that grows the crops, that grows basically my food. I need the individual that grows the cotton and the, the textile worker that, that makes the, the, the garment that I can wear. And on and on and on we go. We understand our dependence upon everyone else. We are folks that will always be, have always been, and, as we said, will always be dependent upon each other. And yet, as we live in a city that I looked it up the other day, in Metro itself, we have 1.3, actually 1.333333 million people. And in Nashville itself, there's over 655,000 people. We become very impersonal. You know, the, 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 neighbor, the neighbor right next door, the fellow that lives across the street, they become nothing to us. The individual that we see in the grocery store, maybe even see in the grocery store every week, become nothing to us. Because a lot of times we realize, too, that, that we've seen those people, but we'll probably never see them again. We can go to the same restaurant and not see the same people if we go every week. We'll see some, but mostly not the same. But yet that doesn't alleviate, that doesn't remove the responsibility that we have 
to be a blessing to the people that we do come in contact with. You've heard me say before, most evenings, not every evening, but most evenings, I leave the house somewhere after supper. I walk up Sawyer Brown, walk all the way up Oak Haven, down Oak Haven, and then to the highway and back to the house. Why? I don't know. Got a mean doctor. But, but I do that. My neighbors and those that drive by me have learned, you better wave because that old man in a funny shirt that's bright orange because he doesn't want to get run over, that's walking real funny, that he's going to wave. And they wave. The only person that ever has sped up on this road to meet me is Stephanie. But that's a whole different issue. <laughs> When we understand, though, we're dependent upon one another. When we understand that, that we need to be a blessing to one another, we ask ourselves, how do we go about doing that? Well, the first one is to be a light. To be a light. Jesus said in John, the eighth chapter, he says, I'm come as a light into the world, verse 12. Now, we know that the world, according to the Bible, lies in darkness in John, chapter 3, verse 19. And the world loves darkness. Why? Because 1 John 5, verse 19, we're all under the sway. The world is under the sway of Satan. And so, so while the world is under that sway, we have to understand that we have to be a light. Why? Because Jesus said for us to be. When Jesus made that proclamation in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, to let your light so shine before men, what he was telling you is each one of us, we are reflectors of Jesus Christ. In my driveway, before I ever moved there, and I've kept it up, there are two very tall reflectors. Why? So if I come in in the night, I can hit in between those two, and I can hit my driveway. They reflect the light of the headlight. We, as Christians, reflect the light of Jesus Christ. Do you know that you will be the only Bible that some people will let in their lifetime? Do you know that you'll be the only light that they see in a world of darkness? And so it's incumbent upon us to be that light, to let that light shine. We're, after all, we're supposed to grow in the image of Jesus Christ, and we're to exemplify, and we're to be that pattern. We read in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 12, where Paul says to Timothy, to the young preacher, Timothy, and ultimately to all Christians to be an example in word and in conduct, faith and spirit and purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Paul says, live your life as the pattern that God wants it to be lived. To live the life that is a blessing to others. To live the life that truly exemplifies and shows others to them. How important is that? Well, it's very important. Why? Because God wants it to be this way. God wants us to be the, the light to the world, the city that's set on a hill. We do not put our light under a bushel basket, Jesus says, but we put it upon a candlestick. As we think of the, the menorahs, the candlesticks that we often see, especially around the Christmas time, that's what they had in biblical times. Jesus says, you let that light shine before man. Don't hide it under a bushel. Story is told of a church out west and had stained glass windows for its windows in the auditorium. And those stained glass windows were of images of individuals, Christians of the past. And this faith called them saints. Of course, all Christians, according to the Bible, are called saints, according to what Peter wrote. But nevertheless, they called these individuals on their stained glass windows, they called them saints. And so one day, the teacher, the Bible school teacher, had taught the children, and she had finished the lesson a few minutes early, and she was waiting uh, on the class to dismiss. And so she was trying to make conversation. So she asked the children, she said, what's a saint? One little boy, man, you shot his hand up. And so she called on him, Johnny, because every child's Johnny. Johnny, what, what's the answer? He said, a saint is someone who lets the light shine through them. Man, that's preacher stuff. That'll work. 
because that's what the Bible says. As Christians, as saints, that's what we do. We let the light shine through us. We become the example. For we're no more conformed to the world, Romans 12, but we're transformed. We're different from the world. We're not like the world. The world's not like us. And we're not like the world. We're different. Isn't it noteworthy? In Acts, the fourth chapter, verses 12 and 13, Peter and John are brought in. They're brought into the council. Why? Because they basically they, they healed a man, and, and really they were posing a threat to the Sanhedrin council. And when they were brought in, they were told certain things. One, not preach the gospel anymore. They were reprimanded. And Peter and John gave beautiful answers. And when they saw that boldness of Peter and John, that courage that they had, here's what they remembered. They knew that they were untrained and they were ignorant men, but they marveled at them. And they thought, we know how and why they're able to answer the way in which they're answering. Here's the answer. They had been with Jesus. It should give us the input that we understand that as we come to the scriptures, we come to learn of the Lord. We come to learn of not only his saving grace, but to come and learn of how he lived his life. If we're to walk as he walked, 1 John chapter 2, verse 5, lovingly, forgivingly, tenderly, compassionately, kindly, in making us a blessing, we're that light. We're that light that lets the light that lets the light shine through us. But then secondly, how do we be a blessing? Be kind. Be kind. We live, don't we? We live in a dog eat dog world. Where really and truly it is the mindset of many, not of all, but of many. That I don't care about you, all I care about is me. I don't care what you, you're concerned about. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care the difficulties that what I'm doing may pose to you. All I care about is me. Now, not everybody thinks that way, thankfully. And we live in a part of the world that may be, I don't know, but may be better than others in this endeavor. But we're reminded to be kind to people. The desire of a man, of a man excuse me, in Proverbs 19, verse 11, you know what it is? You probably guessed it. It's kindness. Solomon in his wisdom says, here's what we want in man. Here's the ultimate desire. To do what? To be kind. To be kind to others. What is kindness? Someone, someone defined it as the oil that takes the friction out of life. That's a pretty good definition. Kindness is the idea of compassionate, gracious, loving, tender, helpful to others. That's what God expects of it, isn't it? We, we read in Ephesians 4, verse 32, we could probably all quote it, be kind one to another. That's important. It's important to the Lord, and the Lord reminds us to be kind. Why? Because we're all depending upon one another. There was a man by the name of, let me get his name straight, Yusef Dale. Yusef Dale met a woman by the name of Cassie Spellman. It was, if you will, just one of those chance meetings. It was in Chicago, of all places. It was after a Chicago Cubs baseball game. This happened about two years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Yusef Dale was trying to hail a cab after the ball game. Yeah, he'd been to the ball game. When you hear in just a minute, you're going to say, why did he go to the ball game? But he did. He's trying to hail a cab, and all the cabs are, are just flying past him. Just they just they Nobody wants to stop. And Cassie realizes what's going on, and so she goes to help. She talks to yourself. She begins to hail a cab, and before too long, they stop. One of the cabs stops. And as they stop, as she wishes him well, she helps Yusef get into the car. And they part. She thought no one would see it. No one was wise to it. No one would know what was going on. 
She went back to her friends and they went on their merry way. There was a man by the name of Harvey that lived in one of those big buildings right close by and he happened to see what was going on and he put as he took some pictures he put all of this uh, in the media why are Casey Spellman and yourself known because yourself was blind and no one would stop to help but Casey stopped and she helped in living the Christian life that's what kindness is. Kindness might be opening the door for someone. It might be smiling at someone. It might be a, a letter of encouragement to someone. It might be a phone call to someone you know. It might be letting someone get in front of you in line. It might be a hundred and million other things, and you, you can make a list far better than I. But you see, the Bible says, be kind. Treat others with respect. Treat others with dignity. Treat others, after all, the way you want to be treated. Because, as you see, not everybody's like us. You think about people in the Bible. You think about a man by the name of Amos who was a sycamore gatherer. You know what a sycamore is? It's, it's kin to the mulberry. We have mulberries around here. Uh, I have a mulberry tree, by the way, in my backyard. There's one over here on uh, Saudi Brown, up by 70. But this sycamore is more of a round fruit than what we have here. Very much of the fig family, very much eaten, but yet the gatherers were just poor, common laborers. Amos fit that category. We read of a man in the Old Testament by the name of David. Yes, he becomes king as we're studying on Wednesday nights in the book of 1 Samuel. But David starts out, do you remember how? As a shepherd boy. Rahab is one that would cause us to scratch our head, though, in Joshua chapter 2. Why? Because she was a prostitute. Zacchaeus is another one because Zacchaeus was a small man, right? Short of stature, could not see Jesus over the crowd, and so he did what? He climbed up in sycamore tree in order to see the Lord. And yet the Lord said, come down. Why? I'm going to your house today. These are people that were touched by other individuals that were not like them. They were different. You see, sometimes we look at people and we say, oh, you're not like me. You don't have the same education level that I have, or you, you don't have the same income level that I have, or you're this, or you're that, or you're the other. And we're reminded, don't judge people. Be kind to them. Be, be an individual that, that is willing to, to reach out and, and help them in a difficult time to, to truly do as the golden rule says, whatever you would that men should do to you, you do also so to them. Matthew 7, verse 12. To be the good Samaritan that stops by and helps someone. We're often so worried about lawsuits and we're worried about this, that, and the other. And we're worried about folks and the, how they'll take us. And yet we need to remember that kindness is shown in many different ways. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, when he talked about how that I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was naked and you clothed me. And he goes through this long list and those that were there listening to this sermon, they asked this question, Lord, when did we see you this way? And Jesus said, inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. In other words, when you stopped and helped, you were helping the Lord. When you smiled, you were letting your light shine, but you were also representing the Lord. When you did a kind deed, you were doing what the Lord would have you to do. So what do we need to be? We need to be sensitive, sensitive to the needs of others, sensitive to the feelings of others. We need not only to be sen sensitive, but we need to be sympathetic. That 
Maybe today folks are having it a little bit better than I, but tomorrow I may have it better than them. To do what I can. Granted, we cannot help every individual that holds a sign on the corners of our streets and give them money or food or whatever. We can't do that. We can't help everybody. And sometimes we're very much limited by our mobility, by our health, by a lot of different things. But we have to figure out what we can do to be kind. And we need to treat others with that kindness. And so if we're going to be a blessing to folks, we need to be kind. But thirdly, we need to care more for others' feelings than we do our own. Boy, this is hard, isn't it? I had to, to really, you know, I had to close my eyes when I was writing this part of the sermon because I thought, oh, this is me to a T. I need to realize this. It's not all, always about us. It's not always about me. Sometimes it's about the other fellow. Now, while we all have a standard of feelings, you know, I have feelings and sometimes you can stomp on them pretty good and you won't get me, but sometimes you will. And you have feelings. And I know that. Why? Because we all do. And in those feelings, my feelings may not meet your feelings. And sometimes I may say some things that might hurt that I don't realize. It's up to you to point it out to me. Hey, Let's talk. At the same time, too, you may say something to me, and if my feelings are hurt, I need to say, hey, let's talk. We need to consider one another's feelings. Why? Because Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24, that we're to do all things to edification. You might say, what in the world? Paul says do everything you do. Do it to build up others. The word edify there is the idea of building up. It's really, if you go back to the history of the word, it's the idea of building the building. And so we're building a building. Well, how are we building a building? Everything we do. We do it to build up others. Paul would talk about in Romans 14. He's talking about this idea of being careful of others' feelings. And he goes to talk about in this chapter, he's talking about certain meats. He says, he says, now, now he says, he says, some believe that you can eat. All meats, and that the Bible says you can. The Bible says you can eat all meats. But he says some believe that you can't. And he says don't kill your brother. Don't destroy your brother that thinks you can't. Well, what do you need to do? You need to have a conversation with him. The idea for us is not so much, okay, well, you can eat this meat and you can't eat that meat. By the way, come fifth Sunday, don't forget, fifth Sunday, September, fifth Sunday, we, we meet and eat. And I know some of you think that eating is more important than meeting. It's not, but, you know, we're going to have church and then we'll eat. Come, be with us. We'll have all kinds of stuff. You like chicken, you're in the right crowd. But we'll have other stuff. It'll be good. But Paul is saying he's not so concerned about the food as he is. Don't destroy your brother's conscience. Be considerate of his feelings. Talk to him. Now, sometimes you can't meet in the middle. Why? Because they're unwilling to meet. But we need to be careful that we are considerate of, of other people's. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. What did Paul say? He says, don't be so concerned about yourself. Think about others first. Remember, remember that great passage where they want to know, they ask Jesus, what's the first and great commandment? Matthew 22. And Jesus comes out immediately. Love the Lord and God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Wonderful passage from the book of Deuteronomy. But then he goes on. He throws in a little extra, if you will. What does he say? But the second's likened to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It didn't say love them anymore, but it said as yourself. Implies self-love, yes. But it goes beyond that to the fact that here's how you love your brother. Here's how you love your neighbor. Here's how you love the individual that's next to you. That you're an individual, that you do all things, beloved, gratification. So we're reminded 
reminded that sometimes we don't consider ourselves, but we consider others. Stories told Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower went to a group of soldiers during World War II. <clears throat> this group of soldiers had been on the front line, but they had, had come back to a camp to rest for a while. They'd been out for many days, and so they'd come back to this camp to rest, and so Eisenhower decided he would pay a special visit to them to encourage them and to build them up. And so Eisenhower went to this camp. He gave his little speech to boost the morale of these soldiers. It had been raining. They'd had a little platform for him, but when he stepped, he stepped off of it, and mud went up well over his boot, and he fell. And some of the soldiers laughed. One of the commanding officers, as he helped Eisenhower up, he said, he said, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that they laughed. And Eisenhower said simply this. He said, Psh. he said, that laugh probably did them far better than that speech that I gave them. We need to realize the feelings of others and take care of those feelings as we're blessings to others. But then, fourthly, we need to strengthen others. We do live, as we said a while ago, in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. We do live in a time and place that's very difficult. We do live from day to day, and we need strength. I mean, we're all, we all have battles. You know, we look at fellas and individuals. We look at, at women. We look at children. We say, man, you, you don't know troubles. They probably do. They may not be like yours. But we all have troubles. We all have aches. We all have pains. We all have difficulties. We all have, have shortcomings. We all have hurts. We all have those difficult times. What does that tell us then? Strengthen each other. Build each other up. Encourage each other. Isaiah and Isaiah 35 says, strengthen the weak knees. Confirm those, those knees. Make them strong. Build up others. Our responsibility sometimes is really to forget more about us and to take the opportunity to help others. Do you remember your opportunities card we gave you at the first of the year? There's still some on the back table. Every time you're looking for an opportunity, use your opportunity card. Use your opportunity card to strengthen someone as they're going through a very difficult time, a very hard and hurtful time. To exhort one another, to encourage one another, Hebrews 3, verse 13, to be an individual that, that, that encourages all wrote right in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. The idea of encourage is the idea of strengthen, to build up. Oh, how beautiful a word. Word fitly spoken, Solomon said in Proverbs 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. We try to figure that one out from time to time. Here's what he says. He says a word spoken at the right time, in the right way, with the right heart, is prettier than any picture you've ever seen. I've seen some beautiful pictures. In undergraduate, I took art appreciation, loved it so much, took art history survey, loved it, enjoyed it thoroughly. Got to see a lot of great things. Seen others personally through my lifetime. Solomon says, you want to see a pretty picture? Words spoken at the right time, in the right way, from the right heart, by the right person, to the right person. How beautiful it is. So while folks are going through difficult times, it's our responsibility, our challenge to build one another up. Lord, make me a blessing. Make me a blessing to those that I come in contact with. Make me one that helps others. Why? Because Philippians chapter 2 verse 17 says of Paul, he says, but even if I'm being poured out as like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Paul said, even if I'm decreasing, but I'm building you up, that's important. Stories told of a little boy that went up to a house and knocked on the door. This was back many years ago, as you can figure. But he went and he knocked on the door. The individual came to the door. He said, sir, I'm selling cards. You're selling cards. The little boy said, yes, sir, I am. 
He said, well, how much are your cards? He said, sir, these cards are a dollar a box. So that tells you how long it's been. He said, a dollar a box? Really? He said, yes, sir. He said, well, what kind of cards do you have? He says, well, I have holiday cards. I have birthday cards. I have special occasion cards. I have all kinds of cards. But, sir, they're a dollar a box. How many boxes do you want? And so the man said, well, let's talk about this for a minute. He said, dollar a box. And the little boy said, yes. He said, what are you doing with the money? He said, well, I'm trying to gather up a million dollars, and I'm going to send that for a missionary that I know and famine relief where that missionary is. A million dollars, the man said, somewhat inquisitive and somewhat skeptical. And the little boy said, yes, sir. He said, do you think you're going to raise that million dollars by yourself? He said, no, sir, I got a fellow helping me. But we're going to do it. We're all headed in one direction. With our eyes focused and set on heaven, may we make our life a channel of blessing to help others, to point them in the direction of which they may ultimately spend eternity with us and with the Lord, more importantly. Be kind. Be helpful. Be a light that cares about others as you strengthen their life. Be poured out like a drink offering. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you come? All together we stand and sing.